Red dot go. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, the scripture says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This passage is often associated with the story of Martin Luther. By the beginning of the 16th century, the broad religious path to eternal destruction in the Western world was well traveled. Countless souls had embraced those doctrines that set forth a system of salvation by works. Very few individuals bothered to ask whether or not the things that the Catholic Church taught were true or consistent with the scriptures. Some did not ask because life was exciting and filled with adventure. After all, this was the era of Mike Machiavelli and Michelangelo, Raphael, Copernicus, and even Columbus. The Western world was alive with art and literature, court intrigue, and political upheaval. The discovery of new worlds and <clears throat> the rebirth of learning. While some enjoyed the Renaissance, others mainly to be found in the countryside were simply struggling to exist. Hundreds upon thousands of peasants were not aware of the voyages of Columbus. They knew nothing of the glories of the Renaissance art and literature until much later. Instead, multitudes endured the terrible realities of life in Europe, where violence and bloodshed were part of everyday life. Life was short, medicine was crude, death was certain, and people who lived past the age of 30 were considered to be old. Women often died in childbirth, and if they managed to survive, an alarming number of the infants did not. The institutional Roman Catholic Church took advantage of the plight of the people. There was financial exploitation as church officials were given and church offices were given to the highest bidder and worse, <clears throat> salvation itself was offered for a price. So greed and graft Moral corruption characterized convents, monasteries, and reached upward to capture the Vatican itself. The glorious light of the gospel grew dim in such circumstances, causing concerned souls to search for salvation. And among those who were struggling to know the truth was a young German lad by the name of Martin Luther. The things that he would eventually be shown by God and by God's grace would restore his soul, reform the church, and literally revolutionize the world. And it all came about in his personal quest, his search for salvation. On November the 10th in the year 1483, in Eisel, Germany, the baby boy was born who was destined to change the world. His parents worked as domestic servants, and then the family moved to Mansfield, where the father, Hans Luther, as his name was then pronounced locally, went to work in the local copper mines. It was not always a happy home into which the child Martin had been born. Both his father, Hans, and his mother, Margarita, also known as Hana, were very strict disciplinarians. Martin would later record that his father whipped him so severely on one occasion, I ran away and felt ugly towards him until my father sought me out for reconciliation. His mother was equally firm, Luther would tell his students later on. My mother once beat me with a cane for stealing a nut until the blood came. Such strict discipline drove me to the monastery, although she meant well. In all fairness to the parents, such 
things were not uncommon at this time in history. Most parents used excessive forces of punishment. Despite the rigorous punishment, Luther honored his parents. Later, when writing a work on monastic vows, the title of it, Martin dedicated the book to his father. He desired to please his parents with his work as a minister, and they were pleased with him eventually, despite some initial opposition to him going into the ministry. For Hans had hoped that Martin might become a lawyer Indeed, Luther's initial studies were destined to lead him in that direction. And he was a very precocious individual, a very brilliant student. In 1501, he entered the University of Erfurt at the age of 17, received the Bachelor's of Arts degree the next year, 1502. And then just three years later, in 1505, Luther earned another degree and began his law studies. So academically, things were going very well for Martin Luther. His father was pleased, he was doing what his parents uh, were happy for him to do. And then something changed one humid day in 1505. While walking back to school on July the 2nd, the 21-year-old law student encountered a fierce lightning storm. Terrified that he would be killed, Luther cried out, Help me, Saint Anne, I'll become a monk. And he meant it. The storm passed, but not Luther's vow. He was determined to keep his word to this patron saint of the biters. Perhaps Martin remembered another crisis experience of his. He was 19 years old when he almost bled to death. And it happened this way. Again, on his way home from school, Luther carried, according to the custom of his day, a sword, and it pierced his leg, and it cut an artery. The wound was severe. Luther's friend ran off to try to find a doctor and medical help. Luther had to put his own finger in the gaping hole to stop the bleeding. And he prayed, Oh Mary, help. Well, it was God the Father, of course. He was gracious. The doctor did come just in time. Luther's life was spared. So having escaped death twice, Luther was not willing to risk a third encounter of the worst kind. He would enter a monastery because there was something else that Luther was concerned about. He was a religious individual, and he was concerned about the spiritual state of his soul. And in particular, young Luther wanted to know how a person could be righteous in the sight of God. He would search for that answer in submission to the discipline and the authority of the Church of Rome. So giving away all of his earthly goods, much to his parents' chagrin, Luther joined the Augustinian order because he wanted to join the most severe order possible. And he joined that where he vowed to die to self, to family and friends, to renounce the flesh, suffer poverty, mortify his body, be obedient to his superiors in all things, and follow the rules imposed upon him. And there was no end to the new rules. Becoming a friar in the Augustinian Monastery, Luther set out to honor his vows of poverty, chastity and obedience through endless acts of confession of sins and the performance of good works. And yet, despite all that Luther did, he failed to find peace with God, and he wanted it so desperately. What would he do? Luther would do more. He would flagellate himself until the blood ran profusely down his back. He would fast 
to the point of exhaustion. And if you look at some of the early paintings of Luther, he is an emaciated young monk. He would sleep on the cold, hard floor. He would do anything and everything to merit the merits of Christ and please God the Father. But somehow, in the deepest recesses of his soul, Luther felt that God was not satisfied. He felt that God viewed him as just another Cain offering the fruit of his labors to an unsmiling God. In the search for personal salvation, Luther continued his studies. Within two years, he entered what is known as the Black Cloister, as he was ordained a priest now in the year 1507. However, that is, this only made matters worse from Luther's point of view, because now he had the awesome responsibility in the form of transubstantiation of offering unto the people of Erfurt the living, the true, and the eternal God. And if you know anything about Catholic doctrine, you know that the doctrine of transubstantiation is where the elements become literally the body and blood of Christ. There's a point in the Catholic Mass where it's through the tinkling of a little bell, and that's the magical moment where transubstantiation takes place and the elements are transformed. And now Luther had to offer the living, the true, the eternal God to the people. How could he do that in a worthy manner? He knew he could not. And so terrified was Martin of the presence of God in the Holy Mass that he trembled at the altar and he could barely finish his first communion. There was something else that Luther trembled at. He believed he had committed the unpardonable sin. Like everything else, Luther confessed to his superior and his most beloved father in the faith, Dr. Johann, and he said, he is God and he is holy. I am man and I am unholy. No matter what I do, he condemns me. I cannot love God and that is my unpardonable sin. Well, the good doctor did not understand the seriousness with which Luther took sin and the unceasing confession that was always upon his heart. Exasperated, the confessor exclaimed, Luther, God is not angry with you. You are angry with God. Don't you know that God commands you to have hope? He was right, of course. Luther was angry that God could not be pleased. And although he had truly sought to love God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind and strength, he found no comfort. There was always this sense of the wrath of God upon his soul. Said Luther, when I am touched by the passing of the eternal my soul feels and treats nothing but eternal punishment. What was he to do? Luther said, I'll do more. And so with renewed vigor, Luther would study scripture and theology. He would teach and he would preach so much that he would not have time for personal meditation and reflection. It was too painful for him. Perhaps a life of zeal and overwork would placate his tormented soul in search of personal salvation. And then there was still something else Luther thought he could do. He would make a pilgrimage to Rome, stopping at various post stores along the way. Once in Rome, Martin would engage in religious rites all to secure a place in heaven. 
he would make a general confession of sins to a Roman priest as opposed to a German priest. He would hear a daily mass. So to the city of Rome, Martin went to work always for the salvation of his soul. At the altar of St. Sebastian, Luther once said several masses in a single hour, and then he was sad. He would later say that my parents were still alive, for I would have loved to deliver them from purgatory with my masses and my other special works and prayers. Well, because Martin wanted to deliver his grandfather from purgatory, Luther crawled up and down the 28 marble Santa Scala, or Holy Stairs, on his knees reciting the Lord's Prayer on each step. These are the stairs that were believed to have been the steps that Jesus went up on before Pilate. By praying this way, it was said that a soul could be saved. The Santa Scala was alleged to be the very stairways that the Lord had climbed. And so when the ordeal was over and Luther arrived at the top of the incline, there was a brief, shiny moment of personal honesty. He stood up. He folded his arm. He looked back down the stairs and he said to himself very quietly, who knows if it's really true. It was almost a blasphemous thought, but Luther had seen some things that had planted seeds of concern in his sensitive conscience already. So this new seed of doubt had fellowship with other seeds of doubt. There was much sin in the holy city that Luther had witnessed. He had personally seen drunken priests, rampant immorality, and open laughter at the saints and all that was holy and sacred. And indulgences were being hung for Christ. And all this and more disturbed Luther. It was true what the people had warned him about on his way to Rome and during the course of his pilgrimage. The closer one comes to Rome, the worse the Christians are, he had been told. When God builds a church, the devil puts a chapel next door, they said. But the churches in Rome were worse, said Luther. If there is a hell, then Rome has been built upon it. He was so disillusioned. Well, by March of the year 1511, Luther returned to the observant Augustinian monastery, but the old doubts still lingered, and the old questions burned even more brightly in his soul concerning the righteousness of God and other matters as well. Luther wanted to know Question, does the righteousness of God merely judge a man or can it deliver him from the power and pollution of sin? Question, is the church alone competent to interpret scripture or can individuals be guided by their own conscience and understanding with the Holy Spirit? Question, why must the Mass be said said in Latin? Why can't the Mass be said in the language of the people? While Luther continued to study and search for the salvation of his soul, his life was about to change. In the little town of Wittenberg, Germany, there was a good man, Duke Frederick III. He was known locally as the Wise. And he was determined that the university that he had recently established should have a new professor who could also be a pastor to the people. The name of Luther in the providence of God was brought to his attention. 
arrangements were made. And in 1517, Luther was brought to Wittenberg to baptize infants, catechize the children, preach to the people, teach the students in the new university, and study the scriptures. While Luther seemed content in his new surroundings, he was uncomfortable that Frederick, the elector of Saxony, Frederick the Wise, was bringing too many religious relics into the realm. And who knows, perhaps 19,013 were a bit too much. The pious prince meant well. He brought the relics for the glory of God and the good of the church. And yet Luther wondered about the collected fragments of St. Jerome and the fragments of St. Chrysostom, the golden mouth one, or hairs from the Virgin Mary, a strand from the beard of Jesus, a piece of bread that was eaten at the Last Supper, and a piece of the original cross. Now by this time in church history, there had been so many pieces of the original cross reported that the Pope had to make a special dispensation and say, it's a miracle. The cross is multiplying itself. <laughs> Question, could such relics be real? Even if they were genuine, could they deliver souls from purgatory and venerate it as taught? Luther was troubled that the symbols of faith were replacing the reality of meaning because if that was happening, then souls were being lost and down. Despite his concerns over the relics, Luther had two other issues to deal with, personally and as a priest. One issue was theological, the other was practical. The theological issue was the ground of justification for how a person is made right before God. And the practical issue was the sale of something called indulgences. It was either late in the year 1513 or 1514 that Luther began to teach openly his students something different from Catholic Orthodoxy. Luther was now convinced theologically that the true ground of justification was by faith apart from good works. And Romans 1.17 confirms it, for there we read, the just shall live by faith. Suddenly, illuminated by God the Holy Spirit, Luther understood that the just do not live by relics. The just do not live by good works, nor by any purchase, papal, parchment. Man is declared righteous in the sight of God by faith. And there was something more. The true church was not the visible organization that could boast about apostolic succession. No, no. The true church of Christ was invisible and consisted of all those in the community of faith who had been given grace to believe in the substitutionary work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation was not corporate, but was common and individual. And if you understand, again, Catholic theology, you understand that the Catholic Church, that salvation comes through the church. And therefore, if you are not in the church, in the Catholic structure, you are outside the sphere of saving faith. And that is a tremendous way to control people because if the Catholic Church excommunicates you and puts you outside that organization and that structure, then according to their theology, you have no saving grace and you will go to hell. So it is a powerful psychological bonding that they hold upon people. But Luther said, no, no, salvation is not corporate, it is individual. 
And salvation was not to be found in sacraments, but in the Savior. The concept that human beings had a spark of goodness enough to seek out God was not a foundational truth, but something that was taught, and I quote, by fools and pig theologians. If you know something about Martin Luther, you know he was a very earthly man, brilliant, but when he wanted to say something plainly, he said it very in a very earthly manner. Humility was no longer a virtue that merited grace. Rather, humility was the soul's response to the gift of God's redeeming grace. Faith no longer consisted of mentally agreeing to the dogma of the Catholic Church, but of trusting the promises of God and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And like a dam bursting with the pressure of floodwaters, gospel truths long neglected began to pour forth from the heart of Martin Luther, and it washed over the people in his carriage. Luther was renouncing everything he had been taught. A religious revolution had been launched, and the world would soon realize it. And in the providence of God, a date had been set. We know it as All Saints Day, October 31st. 1517. Now the issue that would help to crystallize this theological doctrine of justification by faith alone was the selling of indulgences at a wide scale and in an inappropriate manner. Now to understand indulgences, we give you a definition. And it's simply a church document stating that certain sins are forgiven and these sins can be forgiven beforehand so if you are a party rascal and uh, you think you're going to go and do some things maybe the priest shouldn't uh, approve of and your conscience would approve of no problem go buy an indulgence put it in the bottom drawer go have your enjoyable weekend um, back on Monday morning, pull out the forgiveness of sins that you purchased and say, thank God I'm forgiven and here's the proof. <laughs> well, what was behind this selling of indulgences? And the answer was a desire to build a church. Not just any church, but St. Peter's Church in Rome. Julius II the Pope at this time, had laid the foundation for the project. But it was Leo X, his successor, who was determined to bring it to completion. Now Leo initially said he wanted to leave Rome more glorious than he found it. Ah, but there was a practical problem with that stated objective. Leo was a very greedy man. And he was a very licentious man, which means he squandered the resources of the church. Leo was an excessively and extravagantly spoiled son of a very famous Renaissance family, the Giovanni de' Medici family. He had been made a cardinal at the age of 13. Remember we told you that religious offices could be bought at the age of 13, we have a cardinal in the church. He became a pope at the age of 18. And as soon as he was installed in the highest office of the church, Leo went on a spending spree. Today we would have the analogy of a young person set loose with a millionaire's credit card. Expenses for his coronation alone cost 10,000 ducats. Within two years, this pleasure-loving, self-centered, spiritual monarch had squandered the fortune of the church. And so, of course, he needed to replenish the tr treasury of the church. 
And so to do that, he would confer cardinal hats upon those who would pay. He would sell indulgences and he would offer the office of the bishop to the highest bidder. And there were people who were willing to pay a price. In the year 1517, Prince Albert of Brandenburg sent his brother to Rome in order to secure for himself a third religious appointment. He wanted to be the Archbishop of a province. And he said he would be willing to pay 10,000 ducats for the title, based just to keep it religious, on a thousand ducats for each of the Ten Commandments. Leo X agreed to the price, ah, provided the prince would allow uh, a jubilee, a special jubilee indulgence to be sold in the providence with the proceeds to be divided equally between the state and the church. Well, to sell the indulgences in Germany, the services of a man by the name of Johann or John Tetzel were secured. Why? Tetzel was a master salesman. If he were alive today, he would be on television and he would be a great success. He was also a Dominican priest, which gave him some religious authority. Gathering the people around him, the peasants in particular, Tetzel proceeded to share that this latest papal indulgence that would help build St. Peter's Basilica was nothing ordinary. Why, each person who purchased this indulgence, they would share in all the future masses to be said at St. Peter's. Furthermore, they would immediately receive forgiveness for all sins and absolution from all punishment. And there was more. Kind of like one of these modern day commercials where if you buy this, you get more. There's more, said Tetzel. Confession of sins to the local priest no longer had to be made. But best of all, said Tetzel, others could be free from purgatory. Why, as soon as the money clings in the chest, a soul flies up to heavenly rest. <laughs> and then he went to another audience, and he declared that as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Though John Tetzel was not allowed to sell these papal indulgences in Wittenberg, where Luther pastored, he did set up shop just across the river so that people from Luther's parish could still get access to them. With freedom to sin based upon the forgiveness of the Pope being purchased, the moral life of the whole area immediately disintegrated. And outraged at what he was witnessing, Martin Luther finally decided to act. And so on the eve of All Saints Day, October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther went to the church door in Wittenberg and he nailed up a public notice that was written in Latin. There were 95 propositions that Luther wanted to debate with the scholars of the church. He made a public announcement of this fact and he turned the world upside down. In the words of William Manchester, he set the world on fire. The famous document begins with these words. Out of love and zeal for truth, and the desire to bring it to light, the following thesis will be public discussed at Wittenberg under the chairmanship of the Reverend Father Martin Luther, Master of Arts, Sacred Theology, and appointed lecturer on these subjects at that place. He requests that those who cannot be present to debate orally with us will do so by letter. Well, Martin Luther's 95 Thesis, or 
disputation on the power and efficacy of indulgences, as they were formerly called, were full of fire and thunder. And I just offer a couple of excerpts. Thesis. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, what our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said for him, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Thesis 27. This word repentance cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is, confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy, nor can it refer to the purchasing of indulgences, and for this reason they preach only human doctrines that say as soon as the money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. And then turning from the cell of indulgences, Luther had some pointed questions for the Pope about purgatory. Why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love and the dire need of souls that are there if he redeems an infinite number of souls for the sake of miserable money with which to build a church? You can sense the passion and the anger on both sides. Luther with his righteous indignation, his holy anger, and the church with their anger of being called into question, into judgment. Well, Luther had many other questions and statements to make about the Pope, in particular in Catholic dogma in general. Within two months, Johann Tetzel responded with his own thesis statements one of which stated that Christians should be taught that the Pope by authority of his jurisdiction is superior to the entire Catholic Church and his councils and they that should hum and all others should humbly obey his statute. In other words, the Vatican was pushing back and they were sending their spokesman to tell Luther, hush or you're going to be in serious trouble. Well, within weeks, the 95 Thesis was the talk of Germany. Within months, all of Christendom was on fire, and it was inevitable that the contents of the Thesis would make their way all the way to Rome and to the Vatican. And those who were sympathetic to Luther, well, they tried to minimize the controversy on his behalf. And they tried to say that the 95 Thesis document was nothing more than a scholar's difference. After all, others had criticized the church before Martin, such as that most eminent scholar of the Renaissance, Erasmus. And like Luther, Erasmus wanted the Catholic Church to reform. But he wanted to reform the church from within. There are other dynamics at play, and that is political rulers suddenly saw a golden opportunity to break the bondage of the papacy if they sided with Luther. While sides were chosen and people plotted their next move inside the church and out, Luther was officially forbidden to preach anymore about corruption. If he did not keep silent, he would be banished from the church, he would be excommunicated, and if found, he would be imprisoned. And again, remember how powerful a tool excommunication is in the Catholic Church. Well, careful to stay within the confines of Wittenberg, Luther was relatively safe. But the temptation to leave his security for the sake of the gospel grew too strong, especially when a man known as Karlstadt was invited to debate a Catholic theologian, Dr. Johann Eck, at the University of Leipzig. Karlstadt was one of the more radical of the reformers in due time. He was the first, for example, in the year 1521 to hold a Protestant communion service, which means he preached, first of all, without vestments, 
And secondly, he offered both the bread and the wine to the laity. At this time, it was the practice to offer only the bread to the laity, to the people. And that uh, could only be placed on their tongue by a priest. After all, you don't want the peasants handling the body of Christ and maybe dropping it on the ground. And uh, the priest would drink the wine on behalf of everybody. Well, the next day after Karlstedt became the radical reformer in due time, uh, the next day he buried, he got buried. And that was in the year 1521, of course. But in 1517, Luther did not have confidence that Karlstadt could adequately defend the doctrines that were at stake. Ah, said Luther, perhaps I and Philip Melanchthon should uh, join you at the debate at Leipzig. And so it was agreed upon, and the deed was done. During the debate, Martin Luther, of course, overshadowed Karlstadt to crystallize and to articulate many of the great propositional truths he wanted the Catholic Church to reclaim. Proposition. The Church was not founded upon Peter, but upon Christ. Proposition. There is only one universal Church. Proposition. It was not necessary for the soul to be subject to the Church of Rome for salvation when the Church was wrong in matters of faith and practice. Proposition. Salvation is not corporate. It is personal. Proposition. Neither council nor pope has ultimate authority over a soul. Finally, proposition. A simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest hope without it. All of these points and more became too much for Rome. A papal bull was prepared. That is an official document from Rome. The bad monk had to be destroyed, not just stopped, destroyed. He was nothing but said the Pope, a wild boar running loose in Christendom. Luther's books were to be burned. He himself was to be damned forever if he did not recant within 60 days. Anyone who sided with Luther was also to be excommunicated, banned, and cast out of the kingdom of God. Luther's bold response to the whole situation was to burn the papal bull. And he did this in a bonfire on December 10, 1520. Had Rome tried to destroy the truth of the scripture, then let God destroy Rome. In the contest of the wills, Rome had the upper hand, though Luther was not without allies. In particular, there was Frederick the Wise of Saxony, and Frederick felt that a man accused of heresy should at least be given a fair hearing to state his case. Luther would have his trial at the Diet of Worms. The German Parliament would meet and decide what to do with this troublesome priest. In the spring of the year 1521, the Parliament of the German state assembled and demanded the appearance of Martin Luther. Always obedient to the crown, Luther journeyed to Worms, believing that he had been summoned to debate his position. But that was not to be the case. Luther was really being summoned to recant his position at the insistence, not only of the Pope's representative, Dr. Eck, who was there, but the King of Germany, Charles V, the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire. It might surprise you to learn that Charles was only 19. Burns late in the afternoon, 4 p.m., April 17th, 
Luther was ushered into a large room where the nobility of the land had assembled, including the king and all the royalty of Rome. His books were spread out on a large table, and Luther was told suddenly he was there to answer two questions. Straightforward. Are these your writings? Will you recant the writings and the beliefs they contain? For the moment, Martin Luther was caught off guard. He thought he had been summoned in order to debate the faith, not to recant it. And so he asked for time, more time to be given him. And so they said, you have 24 hours, come back tomorrow at the same time. And so at the appointed hour, Martin Luther returned 3 o'clock in the afternoon the next day, and he was ready to give his answer after a night of turmoil and sleeplessness. Yes, the writings were his, and no, he would not recant what he had written. And for this reason, not all of the books are of the same kind, said Martin. Some deal with matters of faith, which popes and priests alike have universally applauded as being worthy of Christian perusal. Others do attack the papacy and the teaching of the papist. But what is that? Truth is truth. And he grew in boldness. Therefore, your most serene majesty and your lordships, since they seek a simple reply, I will give one that is without horns or teeth, and it is in this fashion. I believe in neither hope nor counsels alone, for it is perfectly well established that they have frequently erred as well as contradicted themselves. Unless then I shall be convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, I must be bound by those scriptures which have been brought forward by me. Yes, my conscience has been taken captive by these words of God. I cannot revoke anything, nor do I wish, since to go against one's conscience is neither safe nor right. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. It had been a long journey for this soul in search of salvation. But Martin Luther had found peace with God at last through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And with Paul, Martin Luther finally knew by personal experience that there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, and the just shall live by faith. I'll live that with a little bit.